You know, it's been 75 years since the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed in 1943. 75 years, and it had been in effect 61 years because it was passed in 1882. And it's not gone and totally forgotten. I found a, on YouTube an interesting little um, video. Some student at Penn State uh, went around and asked some students at Penn State what do you know about the Chinese Exclusion Act? Most of the people he asked were Asians. Most of them were Chinese. And they all basically drew blank stares. All this, or maybe one person said, oh, it was a law passed in 1882. That was about the closest that they really came, you know. They, they were clueless. Well, it was a long time ago. Why, why would they need to know? I mean, it's no longer in effect now. Uh, not in the way it was originally formulated. But what I want to, show is how pervasive and long-lasting that law was in terms of its devastating effect on Chinese in America and actually in other countries such as uh, in Canada which had parallel laws of exclusion. The dates were slightly different. All right, uh, 1882 uh, was the year when the law was passed and it said that Chinese laborers could not be admitted as immigrants to the United States. If you were a merchant, a diplomat, or a student, or a tourist, I guess, you could come. And the reason for that being that a merchant generates some economic return, you know, that, that helps generate the economy. Laborers, on the other hand, were seen as a liability as far as white labor was concerned because they were uh, undercutting white labor. So white labor was losing jobs Actually, um, white capitalists were actually pleased to have Chinese labor. You know, the, the big four uh, in California, uh, Charles Crocker, Leland Stanford of Stanford University, uh, Huntington, and one other one I was name I'm blocking on right now, they, they all benefited from cheap labor. So it really wasn't in their best interest to exclude the Chinese. All right, so, why did the Chinese start coming to the United States in the first place? We kind of go back to the gold rush days, probably as a good starting point, you know, 1848, 1849, when gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill in Northern California. And this created a mad rush from all over the world, not just from China, uh, to come, you know, prospect for gold and get rich. And in Southern China, near Hong Kong, a province uh, called Guangdong, uh, there are a lot of little villages there, uh, rural areas, and that's where the majority of the early Chinese in America came from. They didn't come from northern China. They didn't come from western China. They came near Canton because there was a harbor there and it was easy access to ships. And so um, because there was poverty, because there was a famine, uh, there were uh, warlord uh, battles, uh, fights, and so forth, um, a lot of the families sent their young men and maybe even middle-aged men to the United States to try to make money and send it back. All right, so what happened very quickly though, after, you know, 1850, many laws were passed against the Chinese. Uh, a miner's tax, for example, a foreign miner's tax. Uh, Chinese were uh, victimized by violence and, uh, and as well as uh, unfair laws with regard to uh, their rights. They couldn't testify in court against a white person. Uh, they couldn't marry a white person. Uh, they had, uh, could not become naturalized, so they had no political power. They couldn't vote. Uh, so when they basically got excluded from mining or relegated to the, the dregs of what was left over after, you know, the best parts of the uh, gold were taken, 
Uh, the Chinese did get into things like fishing. They worked in lumber, uh, they, logging, and they worked in uh, agriculture. But gradually they kept getting pushed out. They kept getting pushed out until 1860s, early 1860s, when there was this big pressure or interest in developing the Transcontinental Railroad. And, you know, we don't think about that so much nowadays because that was such a long time ago. Was, you know, we have jet travel four hours, you can go coast to coast. But in the 1860s, you know, the United States was not connected. You know, you had the West, you had the East, and you had this big thing in the middle. There was no way of getting across that, except in a covered wagon or something like that. And that was very arduous and strenuous and not an easy undertaking. So the idea was, hey, these Chinese uh, have a reputation for being hard workers, they're reliable. Um, so Charlie Crocker, who I guess was the originator of Crocker Bank uh, way back when, he decided that for the western part of the railroad, which was started in Sacramento, the Central Pacific moved, uh, thank you, uh, westward. And from the east, starting from Omaha, the um, eastern half of the railroad uh, was moving toward. And so they eventually met up in Promontory Summit in, in 1869. And that's where we talk about the golden spike, that they had the ceremony, they, you know, basically ceremoniously uh, got a gold uh, spike, pounded it in, took a few pictures, took the gold back out, put it in a regular iron one. And I mean, they weren't foolish, you know. No. <laughs> so that was a great, moment for American history. The country was united from sea to sea. You could travel across the country, but for the Chinese, it was a very sad day. Overnight, thousands of Chinese unemployed. You're out of work, you finish the railroad. Now, it wasn't quite as bad as that because a lot of them drifted over to other peripheral railroads, like in Texas, Alabama, uh, other parts of the Midwest. So some of them did find work, still working on railroads, but for the most part, um, a lot of them were unemployed and uh, by huge numbers. So what else could Chinese do? Chinese were uh, sort of resourceful and they also were willing to take on tasks that other people might not want to do. So uh, one of the early things that Chinese got into after the railroad was completed uh, and you know, work on peripheral railroads was they started doing laundry business. A laundry business was something that no one likes to do. You know, it's not the most pleasant thing. I was surprised when I did this research to learn that in those days, out in the West particularly, they sent their laundry to Hawaii to be done. And it would take several weeks to get back. So you can see there was an, I couldn't believe that when I read it, but you can see there'd be some advantage if you have some Chinese guy with his uh, wash board and his scrub thing, um, washing your clothes, you know, within a few days. And so anyway, that created a opportunity for Chinese to fill in that void, which was uncontested for a few years until, you know, white laundry businesses and steam laundries got into the act. But uh, Chinese were uh, dominated the laundry business in the certainly 1880s, 1890s, and, and maybe for a little bit longer. Um, they were also vilified for uh, that work, I mean, mocked, made fun of. Um, it wasn't an, obviously a glamorous, prestigious occupation, but it sufficed uh, for these men. Now, many of these men were what we call bachelors um, in the sense that they may have been married and have families in China, but they weren't allowed to bring their wives and children over because they were laborers. In fact, if you read the documents, um, when the person comes in at immigration or, uh, and you, know, you get witnesses to testify, uh, basically uh, you have to have two white witnesses, at least two white witnesses. And there's a phrase in there like saying, I have never seen, whatever, Sam Lee, I've never seen him uh, do any manual labor. I mean, that was basically the gist of it. You had to sort of say, no, he, you know, he's never really sweated at all. You know, he, he's a manager, you know, he's a, He's a merchant. Uh, he, he's not engaged in a lot of manual labor. So uh, that was one business that the Chinese entered in. Now, you also have to consider, especially like in metropolitan areas like Chinatowns in San Francisco, Chicago, New York, you had all these bachelors there. 
Um, they had very, you know, primitive living quarters. They, you know, they, they often shared a, a, a rooming house. Uh, in fact, in some of them, <coughs> the beds never got cold. You'd have a day shift, you have a night shift. Some people would sleep in the day, then they go to work, other people would come and fill in the bunk. All right, now, where are these people gonna eat? You know, they don't have any kitchen privileges or they made that one kitchen for 20 people down the, and, and uh, so Chinese started, you know, their own little restaurants. I mean, they wouldn't call them restaurants in those days, little uh, cafes or whatever, where, you know, they basically have Chinese soul food. They weren't catering to the uh, white, uh, clientele. They were serving village food, stuff that was familiar to these Chinese immigrants. And um, white people wouldn't go down there. They would write uh, maybe in newspaper articles about what unusual stuff they ate and how you know, disagreeable it was or how it smelled strange or whatnot. There were a few writers who, who did talk about this stuff was kind of good, but you know, it was kind of a mixed bag overall. But by and large, the general public was not too interested in Chinese food. Uh, there were cartoons drawn. It was one that I particularly remember showing in the background a Chinese restaurant. And in the foreground are some children walking to the restaurant. One's carrying a dog, one's carrying a cat. Um, they're not c coming to be served. Uh, their, their pets are going to be served in a different meaning of that word. Okay, so that was the imagery, you know, Chinese eat dogs, Chinese eat cats, so forth. So obviously the average, uh, you know, uh, uh, white American is not going to be interested in that type of food. So how is it that now um, Chinese restaurants are so prolific? I mean, so widespread, you, you know, universal and everything. Well, turns out that one legend is that chop suey, that most indelectable dish that no, you know, authentic uh, connoisseur of Chinese food would want to order in a restaurant. Chop suey was the thing that stimulated the curiosity of the general public. Because in the late 1890s, a leading diplomat from China came over and um, he, he was seen to go to a restaurant and order some food. And apparently it was late at night and the visit was unexpected and they didn't have much food. So the cook being resourceful went and got all the choppings and leftovers and odds and ends, threw them all together and cooked something. And then the viceroy was interviewed by the newspaper reporters and they said, what did you have? And they, you know, they told him, chop suey. And how was it? Oh, it was pretty good, you know? And so they wrote it up in newspapers and it got circulated all over the United States. You know, you know, like social media nowadays. Every newspaper, you know, like Associated Press would run it. You, you could look in archives, you find every little town in America talks about this guy eating chop suey. Well, this stimulated a lot of curiosity among the foodies. What is this thing called chop suey? I never heard of it. Well, we need to go and check this out. Well, you also have to remember that in those days, Chinatown was not a tourist attraction. Chinatown was a place where the Chinese were kind of ghettoized. You know, they, they stay there for safety, for security. Uh, they'd be less likely to be attacked. Uh, it was kind of a slummy area. And there was also a lot of bad stuff going on, opium dens, uh, prostitution, uh, Kong wars and everything. So if you were average uh, citizen, why would you want to go to Chinatown? You know, it's pretty dangerous. But the lure of chop suey brought them in. And they all gathered together. And that's a cartoon in the Washington Post, like in the early 1900s, showing a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, sort of affluent um, uh, yuppies uh, riding in a carriage and underneath says, slumming into Chinatown. So that was the phrase they used then, you know, hey, what are we going to do this weekend? Let's go slumming. Let's go to Chinatown and try this chop suey thing out. So chop suey became, I guess, in the phraseology of the time, the cat's meow. Uh, you go and look at old photographs of Chinese uh, Chinatown, Chinese restaurant. Virtually everyone has a prominent sign saying chop suey, more so than even the name of the restaurant. Chop suey is the phrase that that's how you know it's a Chinese restaurant. You don't see that anymore. There's a few signs like that, like Far East Cafe down in LA, uh, Japantown has one still. Uh, there was one in Portland, Oregon until not too long ago. And there was a landmark and uh, they finally uh, took it down because it was dangerous and they were worried it would blow over. And the citizens of Portland petitioned to put that sign back up. <laughs> 
because it said chop suey. That's how important chop suey was. So, so that was another entry of the Chinese uh, into uh, earning a living. Oh, I, you know, I should add one other thing that I forgot to mention. I did run across this really interesting article in an Arizona newspaper from probably about 1910 or 1920. I don't remember the exact date. It was talking about how um, the white um, citizens of that little town were going to boycott the Chinese laundry. They wanted to put him out of business, okay, because he was, you know, dominating the business. So they all resolved, we're going to boycott this laundry. So then the, as the news article goes, um, they, you know, they, they had a, a teenage boy go by, pick up all the laundry, and then take it uh, somewhere and get it done. And then he would bring it back when it was done. And so they said, one day, um, the, the kid didn't bring the laundry back. So they said, well, where's the laundry? He said, oh, the Chinaman still has it. So, so what was happening was this kid was collecting the laundry. That was, they were boycotting the Chinese laundry. And he was taking it to the Chinese laundry, and then he was charging an extra dollar or something for the laundry to come back. He wasn't, so the boycott was not very effective. Basically, it was an end around. <laughs> they still took the laundry to the, to the Chinese laundryman. So I thought that was kind of a really interesting historical side note to, to this whole issue. But yeah, there were a lot of issues with boycotting Chinese in the restaurants as well, because um, there was concern about uh, white women working in Chinese restaurants, like uh, waitresses, uh, uh, receptionists, and so forth. So <clears throat> there was worry about you know, interracial marriage. And um, aside from that, there was actually a big concern like around 1919, because in New York City, Elsie Siegel, who was a young Irish woman who was working as a, a tutor of English for Chinese in Chinatown. She disappeared and she was found stuffed in a steamer trunk in a Chinese laundryman's living quarters. And so there were illustrations of this you know, in political sat cartoons showing the, you know, the, the danger of Chinese uh, men to uh, white women. So there were all those kinds of fears that were uh, activated by that one incident. And there were sightings of this guy, Leon uh, Lee or Leon Leong or whatever. <laughs> the heat show up everywhere. You know, someone said, oh, we saw him in Alabama. Oh, no, we saw him in Iowa. You know, every time they saw a Chinese guy, they said it must be the guy, you know, because they all look alike, right? So <laughs> that was part of the, you know, the way Chinese were perceived. They, they all are inscrutable. They all look alike, you know and um, we don't want anything to do with them. Okay, now, Chinese also opened grocery stores. Uh, now, grocery stores were like a different category in the sense that um, they were merchants. Uh, laundrymen were not actually merchants. I was deluded for a long time into thinking the laundrymen were merchants because my father was a laundryman in Georgia. And uh, I knew he got in, so I just kind of made the equivalents and said, well, Gee, laundrymen were, were merchants. But then some of my historian friends told me, no, they weren't. They were considered laborers. But the categorization changed from different decades. Well, some years they would be considered laborers, other years they wouldn't. Same thing with restaurants and so forth. So the definition changes with the, you know, with, with, with particular year we're talking about. So um, the grocery stores were mostly in uh, southern regions. Uh, Mississippi being the most prominent in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, virtually every Chinese from probably like the late 1890s to probably the 1950s or later, they all ran small mom and pop grocery stores, mostly in black neighborhoods. Uh, when I started doing research on this, I always kept looking for a Chinese laundry. I couldn't find a single Chinese laundry in the Mississippi Delta, which kind of startled me a little bit because I had found Chinese laundries everywhere, you know, all across the U.S. in archives and everything and, and uh, business directories and so forth. So I asked uh, these uh, Mississippi Chinese that I knew, I said, uh, were there any laundries down here? Chinese have any laundries? They said, no, 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 they were never any. Well, actually, I did find one that was in 1910, but none of these people were born or living then. So there were a few Chinese laundries for a while, and then they all disappeared because they were making more money being grocery store owners. Mm -hmm. And also my, my reasoning was, hey, uh, 
If you're gonna work in the fields all day picking cotton, what would you rather have, a full stomach or a clean clothes? So that's why there were no laundries in the Mississippi Delta, is my reasoning. So <clears throat> one other uh, really interesting thing I found that Chinese did, and this was really startling to me. In 1870, the third or maybe fourth most frequent occupation for Chinese listed in the census records was domestic, domestic servant, houseboy. Uh, okay, houseboys did cooking, they did cleaning, they were nannies, uh, you know, they were like, you know, if not slaves, there were certain servants, you know, some of them got maybe mistreated, some of them got well treated. Um, there was some advantage to being a servant. Actually, when you stop to think about it, these Chinese learned English. Uh, but from, from the people who hired them. Uh, so that gave them a connection. And then later, they were ahead up over other Chinese <coughs> who hung out in Chinatown and didn't know how to speak English. So you could think of that as like an unexpected benefit. Uh, now, why were there so many Chinese in domestic service? Um, turns out that a lot of these Chinese who were domestic servants were young boys. Uh, you, you probably wouldn't want to hire a 60-year-old Chinese man to do all the housework and all the, you know, he's probably got arthritis and he can hardly move, you know, he can't chase children around. But, you know, you get a 15-year-old, you know, boy or a girl or whatever, and, you know, you give them all these chores to do. They said, uh, these Chinese are really reliable and they don't complain. Well, they, a lot of them didn't know English, so they <laughs> couldn't complain too well. Uh, they, actually they, they actually preferred the Chinese over the Irish because the Irish are the other main source of domestic work uh, servants, especially on the East Coast, like New York. So Chinese and Irish at the bottom of the social ladder in the late 1800s. And that's why you got a lot of Chinese-Irish marriages or you know, children of Chinese-Irish uh, liaisons because they were both down at the bottom of the social ladder. And since the Chinese were not allowed to bring their, their wives over and, and women couldn't come over, uh, there was very little supply of um, women for the Chinese, uh, of Chinese ancestry to marry uh, or to form families with. So some of them formed families with African-Americans, some of them formed families with Irish. But so Chinese uh, sort of dominated uh, domestic service. And then in 1870, there were more Chinese listed as domestic servants than there were in the laundry business which, you know, I was kind of shocked when I saw that. So I, I looked into this further. You know, a lot of those uh, boys came over, missionaries brought them over. Missionaries in China, they said, yeah, you know, we had a houseboy in, uh, you know, Shanghai or whatever, you know, they were really good servants. Let's, let's petition to bring them in. So if you have as uh, your advocate at the Immigration Bureau uh, uh, office, uh, an influential, uh, maybe even a legislator or politician or missionary, they have some status. And um, so that helps you get into the country. Now, later, of course, when those boys grew up, uh, some of them maybe accumulated some money and they had some English and they were still young enough that they could go and leave domestic service and go out on their own. So, see, it's interesting that um, Chinese were basically filling feminine roles. Uh, they were doing laundry, they were doing cooking, they were taking care of children and households. Traditionally, feminine roles. And that's how Ch Chinese men were seen as feminized, you know, that they weren't really, you know, masculine in the, you know, Western sense of the word. So, uh, when the Chinese um, came over, as was mentioned before, uh, because um, it was illegal or not permitted for laborers to come over, but you could bring, if you were a merchant, you could bring a family member over. You could, you know, petition to bring a family member over. So Chinese hit upon this um, procedure or method called the paper sun. And it's not just sons, but <clears throat> predominantly sons. There were paper daughters too. If you brought a daughter over, then you'd obviously call her a paper daughter. But most people brought sons over. And how this worked, there were different ways. But some of the merchants who were quite 
prosperous in Chinese merchants, they go back to China. And every time they go back for a visit, they would come back and report that they had a child born in China. And someone pointed out, like, was it 99% of them have to be boys, you know, defying the laws of probability. But apparently immigration wasn't too <laughs> suspicious for a while. So anyway, so then later, maybe seven years later, 10 years later or whatever, they would petition and say, you know, I have this son over in China. He's 10 years old. I need to bring him over uh, so, you know, he can, you know, learn English or whatever, you know. So he would, that, that, that uh, son, who actually wasn't his son, uh, because once you got that document, you have a slot and you take that slot and you, you could sell it to someone who's a laborer who wants to bring his son over but can't otherwise do it. All right, so let's say Mr. Wong, who is a merchant, has created, let's say, three slots for sons over the last decade. So he finds Mr. Lee, who's a laborer, who wants to bring his son over. So he says, well, you know, give me, I don't know, $500 or whatever it is, and I will give you this paper document. Okay, so Mr. Lee's son comes over. He has to change his name now. He no, can no longer be with the surname Lee. He has to have the name Wong. So that's why a lot of our family histories are all screwed up. <laughs> we don't know who's who because you know, a lot of us don't know how this all came about. Um, Chinese name records are also exacerbated by the fact that since this uh, uh, immigration people put the names on backwards sometimes, you know, they uh, put the surname first and then the, the, the given name afterwards. And in the early days, like 1850s, 1860s, they all thought the Chinese all the last name was Ah, because they said, what's your name? Ah uh, Lee. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, Wong, okay. <laughs> so you get this long list of uh, census sheets and there are all these Ahs there. My God, what a huge clan these Ahs are. So it turns out that really wasn't their name at all. So this is where it kind of really kind of gets complicated. So um, probably, you know, starting around the, you know, 1920s, 1930s, things kind of got a little better in some ways and, you know, worse in other ways. They still had to, for a while, uh, have problems with like, uh, like in 1892, they made them carry identity cards, basically, you know, saying that uh, if you didn't have this card, you could be deported. You know, you had to show you know, proof of who you are. And that's something that's kind of being, you know, bandied about in recent years to be resurrected. Um, so the uh, Chinese, when they uh, came over, by the way, back, getting back to paper sons, when they come to the immigration station, uh, most notably uh, between 1910 and 1940, it was at Angel Island. And my friends Joe and Liz are docents at Angel Island Immigration Station, so it's really good to see my old friends here. Uh, they're here from Alameda and Sun City uh, Snowbirds. And so anyway, they could tell you a lot more about Angel Island than I could. But uh, if you read the transcripts of the interrogations, they're quite intensive um, because they, they're, they're, they know that a lot of these names are fake. And so the immigration officers really want to scrutinize you to see if you know who all your relatives are and if you know exactly what the village looked like where you allegedly come from. Uh, they want to know um, how many stairs are in front of the house, uh, how many windows on the east side, you know, is there a lake nearby? Well, how would you know? Because uh, that, that's not re really your papers. You've got someone else's papers. So the person who sold you the papers just kind of give you all this information. And they say, take all this information, memorize it on the ship as you're coming across. And when you get off the ship, toss it overboard. Don't bring the paper with you, you know. So you read some of these transcripts, they'll really um, curdle your blood. I, I found my father's records because he was a paper son. And they asked him a lot of questions. It went on and on and on. And I was like vicariously living his ordeal. And uh, there were a number of times where they'd say to him, um, well, you said that uh, your windows on the west, uh, there were four, but uh, your alleged father says there were three. And I thought, oh my God, they got him. <laughs> and then I'd read somewhere else, you know, your alleged father says there was no lake nearby, but you say there was. And oh, I thought, oh, how did he get in, you know? And, but 
I figured out later that he never changed his mind. He always said, I am just telling you what I remember. And so like, to the best of my knowledge, this is what I'm saying. Now, I don't know if that's what got him through, but he was pretty calm about it. He never sort of said, oh, you're right. My father was right. You know, I changed my mind, you know, because that would be, they got you. And you, you never really know. I didn't know whether they were baiting him or not, you know, just testing him. You know, it's like saying good cop, bad cop. You know, they said this, what do you say? But that's kind of blood curdling. Uh, my mother, her questions were different. They usually had something to do with, are you a prostitute? Are you going to be a prostitute? Why do you want to come to this country? They were all kind of oriented along those directions as an additional set of questions that they would all be asked. Um, so um, the other main source, I guess, of Paper Sons um, was um, the earthquake in 1906 destroyed a lot of the records in San Francisco. And so they had no way of uh, contradicting what people said. So they could say, oh, I was born in San Francisco. You know, well, there's no way they could disprove it. Um, so that also created some uh, opportunity for the Chinese to, uh, you know, kind of take advantage of the situation. Now, in 1943, um, I kind of had a personal connection with this in a way because um, Madame Chiang Kai-shek, came to the United States in 1943. She was the first woman uh, to speak to Congress. And she came to raise money for the war effort against Japan during World War II. And uh, she actually came through my hometown of Macon, Georgia, because I was about five or six at the time, and I was dragged out with my siblings to go stand in the hot June sun, hot, humid Georgia sun. and wait to see a little parade for her because she was going to come and receive honorary doctorate from a local college. Little did I know at that moment, or even years later, but an archivist found that not only was Madame Chiang Kai-shek, of course, in that, those days her name was Mei Ling Soon, she and her two sisters, she had uh, two older sisters, one was married to Sun Yat-sen and the other was uh, married to a finance minister. They all three lived in Macon, Georgia in like 1910. And uh, that's another interesting story. You know, if you want to know more, I can tell you why you kind of, why would they go to Macon, Georgia? Um, but um, what was of interest was there's a newspaper article in 1910 saying that alien denied admission to white school. Well, who was this alien? It was Mei Ling. Okay, so 1910, she's excluded from the white school. So she had a private tutor, and then eventually she went up to New England, but uh, to college. But uh, then 1943, she comes back and sort of triumph. You know, she's one of the world's, maybe at that time, the world's most influential woman, uh, certainly well known. And so that's where I kind of feel like my little brush with history. I had a little connection there. Um, well, anyway, they. Um, decided uh, in the late part of that year in December, I believe, they repealed the um, Chinese Exclusion Act. And uh, they felt like uh, there was pressure because they said, you know, you're, you're in there um, fighting this war with China as your ally, and you're not letting Chinese people come in. So how can this be? You know, so for political expediency or to make it look good, they said, okay, we'll uh, rescind the law. Now, Lest you think this was a major triumph, because it's often presented as such, bear in mind that when they repealed the law in 1943, they said, okay, henceforth 105 Chinese worldwide can come into the United States. 105, are you kidding me? There wasn't 105,000, no, it was 105, you know, five more than 100. So what kind, of, what kind of a concession is that? I mean. It was actually like the War Brides Act, like several years later, brought in thousands of Chinese women because men, Chinese men who had fought in the U.S. citizens, or not even citizens, but Chinese men who were in the U.S., whether they were citizens or not, if they fought in the armed forces, then the War Brides Act, in, I think it was 1945, allowed them to bring a wife over. And so that brought in a lot more than 105. So that sort of changed the landscape for Chinese Americans. Things got better for them. But only for a short while, only for a short while. So the bliss was off by the early 1950s when China and the Korean War and communist China, Mao Zedong, okay? So now 
Chinese were no longer, you know, as well accepted. Now there was suspicion. Now there was concern, you know, these Chinese are communist sympathizers. Uh, so can we trust them? You know, they're inscrutable. They're the yellow peril. Uh, you know, the Fu Manchu, all those images come back and they're resurrected again. And so, uh, in 1959, they made a uh, offer to the Chinese community. They called it the confession program. <coughs> they said, look, your names are all screwed up. Your family names are all screwed up. Uh, if you confess, we will forgive you. In other words, you can come in, change your uh, documents and get your correct name. Mr. Lee, you can now be Mr. Wong or whatever it was I said. Now, this was not an easy solution because you had whole families fighting among each other. Because if I have 15 family members, I cannot unilaterally go in and confess because it has implications for all my relatives. And for some of them, they don't want to get their name changed, you know, for whatever reason. So that, you know, created a real problem. Uh, and part of the reason for that confession program is they wanted to put an end to what nowadays is looked on with disfavor uh, by the administration as chain migration, because this is what was going on. You know, a relative would bring over a brother or a cousin or uh, a son to help with the business. And that was, in a sense, chain migration. You know, one relative bringing another. Now, there are some things that I guess you could say opposed to chain migration. But one thing that's kind of overlooked in the present discussion is let's say if you have a person working and they don't have their family with them, would they not be better off if their family members were with them, even if the family members were not actually working as, as employees or, or in a business? So you have this situation where you say, oh, we're going to go and uh, let the best and the brightest come in, but we're not going to let their family members come in. Well, how productive is that person going to be realizing that their family members can never come? So I think that has to be kind of examined in this uh, discussion about whether you know, chain migration is a, is a way to go or, or what are some pros and cons about it. All right, now, fortunately, I guess uh, you can say nowadays, if you say, starting around the 1960s, they started talking about Chinese Americans as the model minority. And that was kind of a dubious uh, honor in a way. Uh, while on the one hand, it kind of felt good there were some people who were very suspicious about this because they were saying, by implication, other minorities are not models. So it's all like saying, hey, the rest of you guys, you need to follow the, the Chinese and other Asians. Like they're, you know, they're working hard, they're family oriented, they're law abiding, this and that. So, it, it, you know, it was divisive and, uh, you know, not um, politically uh, uh, the best approach to take. But um, I think you can say that if you look in the last, uh, 20 or 30 years, Chinese have been able to break through in a lot of areas where they never were before. There were always sort of like doctors, lawyers, uh, dentists, uh, maybe even surgeons, but there were no actors, there were no politicians, or virtually none, uh, people in the arts, uh, dancers, uh, uh, singers, and so forth. And now, Chinese have kind of broken through a lot of those barriers that they were uh, previously unable to do. But again, it's like, Things go back and forth. So now what about the, the flip side? Okay, FBI director, one what, less than a month ago, talked about being suspicious of the Chinese and all their espionage and all their spies. Uh, all right, so, you know, we, we take one step forward, we take one step backwards. So, you know, the point being that we, we can never really be completely content or satisfied that the victory is over. <laughs> Uh, so there's a phrase among Asian Americans and Chinese Americans particularly, uh, forever foreign. Are we forever foreign? Uh, and I had this image I was going to show you of uh, Michelle Kwan, born, you know, uh, Olympic figure skater in about, what, 10 or 15 years ago uh, in the uh, Olympics, and she didn't get first place. And the headline said, American defeats Kwan. Now, Kwan was born in Torrance, California. So if she wasn't American, well, was she? But it's sort of like um, unconscious maybe or whatever. Maybe the headline writer didn't intend to make that as a, a you know, a put down, but it just assumed, oh, she's Chinese, she can't be American. So you, you forever have that. So what I, I've been doing um, after I retired from uh, teaching psychology for 40 years is I've taken kind of a personal interest in the history of 
Chinese in America, and I've learned a lot um, and um, I continue to learn. And I'm sort of motivated in trying to disseminate a lot of this information because I know the younger generation, uh, I don't want to overgeneralize, but is not as interested in this because it just seems so, you know, back in the past that, that, that they just can't get a clue that this ever happened. But if you don't learn about this, there's a danger it will happen again, that, that uh, you need to, to know this history of how Chinese uh, have been treated in the United States and what they've had to overcome. And um, to be able to maintain that, it's helpful for them to know, you know this overview of, of the history of Chinese America. William Faulkner said, the past is never really past. So think about that, okay? Um, there's some profundity in that you know, observation. So anyway, I, I would like to uh, entertain any questions and thank you for your attention.